As the Arthur J. Kenya Dean, it is my honor to open the Charles Widger School of Law session of the 176th Annual Commencement of Villanova University and the 64th exercise of which Juris Doctor degrees will be conferred. Mr. Brian McCabe of the Office of Mission Ministry will lead us in the invocation. After the invocation, please remain standing for the national anthem, which will be sung by Shannon Beam. <clears throat> Creator God, we gather today as people of different backgrounds and religious traditions, mindful of the days that have brought us here with eyes of hope set on the future. We are grateful for all the experiences which have shaped this experience of the graduating class. The classes and assignments that have challenged them to see with new eyes and reason with new methods. The classmates who supported them in times of struggle and celebrated with them in moments of triumph. The faculty and staff who have accompanied them along this journey, providing knowledge, inspiration, and counsel. The clients and colleagues who have opened their eyes, challenged their perspective, lifted their spirits, and reframed their understanding of the law. And for all of the loved ones who have supported, waited, endured, encouraged, and loved each member of this class in countless ways. For all of these things and many more that go unspoken, we are grateful. As we prepare to send these graduates forth from this place into communities and organizations, we remember that you sent your disciples an advocate in the Holy Spirit to give them courage, strength, and wisdom. We pray that these graduates each experience these same gifts on the road ahead. The courage of conviction, strength of character, and wisdom in discerning the fulfillment of their calling. We pray too, formed and inspired by their time at Villanova, that they may each serve as an advocate for all. May they be doves of peace, resolving conflict and promoting right relationship. May they be flames of passion for truth and goodness, sharing their light with others. May they be winds of mercy, lightening the burden of those they encounter. May they be the water that satisfies and sustain those who thirst for justice. Empowered by the Spirit, may their hard work and dedication bear fruit in the lives of all they touch. In this time of celebration, we raise our voices to you and open our hearts and hands to one another. We pray this in your good and holy name. Amen.
good. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Shannon. On behalf of the faculty, I welcome and salute the class of 2019. I welcome the families and friends of the graduates because without your support, the class of 2019 would not be here today. Before proceeding, let me introduce the Reverend Peter M. Donahue, President of Villanova University, and Dr. Patrick Majidi, Provost of Villanova University. We gather today to celebrate the personal and academic achievements of the candidates for Juris Doctor degrees and the Master of Laws and Taxation degrees, and to honor the outstanding professional achievements of our Medallion Award recipient. This year, the law school is proud to present our Medallion Award to an especially worthy recipient, Judge Cheryl Ann Krause of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Todd Agard, Vice Dean, will introduce Judge Krause. And Judge Krause, could you please join us? Judge Cheryl Ann Krause has served on the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit since July 2014. Her distinguished career is an inspiration for her commitment to excellence and to advancing the public good. Judge Krause was born in St. Louis, Missouri and grew up in nearby Wynwood, just a few miles from here. She received her Bachelor of Arts summa cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania in 1989 and her Juris Doctor with highest honors from Stanford Law School in 1993. After graduating from law school, Judge Krauss served as a law clerk for Judge Alex, Alex Kaczynski of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and then for Justice Anthony Kennedy of the United States Supreme Court. After her clerkship with Justice Kennedy, Judge Krauss practiced law as an associate at Davis Polk and Wardell in New York City, as an assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York, as a shareholder at Hangley Aronchuk Siegel and Pudlin, and then as a partner at Deckert. Her legal practice focused on white collar criminal defense and government investigations. While in private practice, Judge Krauss founded the Philadelphia Project, a partnership between Deckert and the Public Interest Law Center of Philadelphia to improve the quality of education for children with disabilities. She also served as outside counsel for the City of Philadelphia's Board of Ethics and on the board of directors of the Committee of 70, the nonpartisan civic organization focused on fair elections and government integrity. In addition to Judge Krause's illustrious career as an attorney and as a judge, she has distinguished herself as an academic as well. Early in her career, she served as a lecturer and visiting scholar at Stanford Law School. More recently, she has taught courses at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where she founded an appellate litigation externship program. Father Peter, Provost Majidi, Dean Alexander and members of the class of 2019, it is my honor to present the Honorable Cheryl Ann Krause for the Medallion Award. Father Peter, Provost Majiti, Dean Alexander, faculty, friends, and family of today's graduates, and most importantly, class of 2019, thank you for the honor of the Medallion Award and the opportunity to address you on this very happy day. Congratulations. What a tremendous accomplishment for you and all those who have championed you along the way. For the support systems that are in the room, take a moment and let what today means sink in. No more harried phone calls that end with, sorry mom, I gotta study. No more tuition payments, unless you have other kids and then I feel your pain. 
No more worrying that your child's primary source of nutrition will be pizza and coffee. And for the graduates, in addition to marking the end of exams and cold calls by professor types, at least until you appear before me or my colleagues at oral argument, today marks a day where you can finally breathe a collective sigh of relief. So stop, reflect, and cherish this moment and the celebrations that follow before you hunker down to study for the bar or start your jobs. As the bedrocks of our profession and as budding attorneys, that's what you are. Introspection is particularly important. For the past three years, you've learned what the law is, and when embarking on a career as an attorney, that's a good place to start. But that's what it is, a starting point. Like the great Impressionist painters who began with formal art training before breaking with convention, you've been steeped now in legal tradition. But now, you have the opportunity to break the mold to take those lessons that have been imparted to you by your dedicated faculty here at Villanova and to push boundaries by shaping the law, by expanding the ways you can use the law to do justice. And less obviously, but as I'll explain perhaps most importantly, by bettering the legal profession itself. I say most importantly because in your role as lawyers, you are stewards of the role of law in this great nation. And what you do matters. It matters to building public confidence in the profession, public trust in our courts and system of government, and public perception of legitimacy and fairness in our justice system. Our country and the next generation are counting on you to be good stewards. And while it may seem counterintuitive, part of being good stewards is also being change makers. So let's talk first about change in the law. Now, that may seem like a strange choice for a commencement speech at a law school, given that you're entering a profession that's known for its rules, and some might say its rigidity. Consider the term stare decisis, which literally means to stand by things decided. There aren't many professions where one of the organizing principles is that you are bound by what's happened before, and you're expected to say it in Latin, no less. But important as stare decisis is, to consistency and continuity. There's new precedent to be made. And sometimes there are old opinions that cry out for reconsideration. Remember that what's now commonly accepted or considered well-established precedent was not always so. And behind those changes that we now accept as the fabric of the law and our lives were people, young lawyers just like you, who thought change was needed and had the initiative and the self-confidence to challenge the status quo. Take the notorious RBG, for example. By this point, she's something of a cultural icon, but remember the enormous effect that she's had on American law started when she was a relatively obscure young lawyer who thought creatively about what the law could be and how strategically she could achieve important goals, despite firmly entrenched Supreme Court precedent to the contrary. Or take Edgar Kahn, who within one year of graduating law school, co-authored an article called The War on Poverty, A Civilian Perspective. Many credit that article as the genesis of the program that we know today as the Legal Services Corporation, the single largest funder of civil legal aid programs in the country with more than 800 offices and that provides free legal services to more than 1.5 million indigent clients each year. Or the many attorneys who, against all odds, argued that the then mandatory federal sentencing guidelines violated a defendant's Sixth Amendment rights by allowing sentences to be imposed based on facts that were not found by a jury. Those cases eventually percolated up to the Supreme Court in cases like Apprendi and Booker. And after nearly 20 years of mandatory guidelines, a whole generation of lawyers that took that as a given. The guidelines are now advisory with sentencing discretion restored to our district courts. And for the future transactional lawyers in the room, fear not, creativity is not the sole province of litigators. Anyone here who has taken a course in corporations and wrestled with the pros and cons of adopting a poison pill knows that corporate attorneys are no strangers to creative legal thinking. Every day, our country, our democracy, our economy benefit 
from young lawyers like you who have a vision and make it a reality. So much as law school has taught you to stand by things decided and respect the status quo, don't lose sight of your ability to make change. Now we've talked about the fact that you can make change. Let's talk about how. How do you breathe life into that motto of truth, unity, and charity? One way is public service. And, and as you heard uh, a little in that very kind introduction, uh, I've had that experience and it's immensely rewarding. Whether as a prosecutor, a defender, a civil servant, working for any one of the myriad nonprofits that deal with housing, public health, education, civil rights, religious freedom, public integrity, or any number of wonderful causes. But I've also had the opportunity to work in private practice, and for all the knocks to the profession, it is a noble calling. The mission, through zealous advocacy and diligence, is to protect your client's rights, property rights, contract, privacy, custody, intellectual property. And so in the days ahead, even when the adversarial nature of private practice can make the day-to-day -day feel like a grind, don't lose sight of the bigger picture, of the interests and values that brought you to law school, and the broader principles that are at play in every single case you will handle, whether it's putting the government to its burden of proof or protecting the rights of shareholders to good governance. And in private practice, of course, Pro bono is another great way to make change and to make yourself a better lawyer in the process. Whatever form it takes for you, find something you care about and do it. And if that opportunity doesn't exist, then create it. Now I understand the thought of approaching someone 20 years your senior with a proposal to engage in particular pro bono projects may sound a bit ambitious, but if you're hesitant to put yourself out there, welcome to the club. As you heard, when I was a practicing lawyer, one of the things I did with a local law school was to organize an externship program between my law firm and law school to accept pro bono assignments from the Third Circuit. The idea was to provide an opportunity for students working under the supervision of law firm partners and associates to try their hand at appellate litigation and hopefully have an oral argument out of the experience. In one case, there was uh, an appeal that the court actually calendared for argument, and we held multiple moot courts, the law student prepared tirelessly, and then just a week or so before the big day, the court issued a terse notice that said the case would be submitted on the briefs without argument. It was, of course, a terrible disappointment for the student and all of us working with him, but it, it also struck me as a lost opportunity for the bench to support the professional development of those rising in the bar. So I asked some more senior partners if for the sake of at least future externs, whether we might write the chief judge and let the Third Circuit know about our concerns and the invaluable experience that oral argument would provide to young lawyers who are willing and with the support of a law firm were able to use to take on pro bono cases. But I was assured that the court was already well aware of that, and no one wanted to rock the boat raising the issue. Well, uh, shortly after that, I was nominated uh, to the court, and I had a congratulatory phone call from that chief judge. So what better opening, right? <laughs> well, he, he was not only surprised and disappointed that it happened, but also extremely receptive. And it became an agenda item at the next judges' meeting, my first. And it's now our court policy and practice that oral argument is presumptively granted in all cases that are argued by appointed counsel. I share this story for two reasons. First, to urge you to act when you see opportunities for systemic improvements, whether it involves writing a letter to a chief judge or approaching the partners about a concrete change that you can envision in the law firm. If you don't ask for what you want, that's a surefire way to see that it doesn't happen. Second, don't assume that someone above you in the hierarchy is going to say no. As with any great legal idea, it may be that it wasn't asked before, or that no one made an argument that was as persuasive as you will. Which brings me to my final point, the change that you can make, 
and we're counting on you to make in the legal profession. Although we've made great strides, we still have a long way to go, and you'll be the ones to move us forward. I'd like to focus on three areas. First, attorney satisfaction and well-being. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that lawyers work hard, and working too hard can lead to burnout. But the legal profession is plagued by more than individual burnout. A 2016 study of almost 13,000 lawyers found that nearly a third had struggled with depression within the last year. That's three times the rate of the general population. And about 21% had problems with alcohol and substance abuse. The attorneys with the highest rates were the youngest, those in their first 10 years of practice. For all the investment that you've made in your legal education at this point, and everyone here has made with you, you want, and we all want you, to be able to sustain this career for the long haul. You've heard the expression, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Well, what you're embarking on today is more than a marathon. This is real life. This is the rest of your professional life. And you will need to find your own balance of work, family, and other pursuits. So as you advance in your careers, you'll need to learn to draw boundaries and figure out ways to sustain and nourish yourselves physically, mentally, and spiritually. And for those of us in positions of leadership, and you, as you rise into those positions, we need to cultivate environments where there's not unnecessary fire drills and with reasonable hourly expectations where lawyers can thrive in their personal and professional lives. We also need to improve the experience of practicing law, and that means prioritizing professional courtesy. Not only speaking civilly to one another, but also being civil, or better, respectful and collegial. A study released just this past Tuesday from the International Bar Association surveying 7,000 people in 135 countries reported bullying behavior and sexual harassment rife in legal workplaces around the world, with half of the women and a third of the men reporting the experience of being bullied in connection with their employment. That's shameful, and we must put an end to it. Civil litigation should not be an oxymoron. To a person, whether it's the mail carrier, administrative assistant, a peer, or a senior partner, treat each as a human being with dignity and respect, and expect the same for yourselves. If an adversary needs an extension for personal reasons, don't say no simply because you can. Your reputation will precede you, and small kindnesses will come back to you in ways you could never anticipate. They'll also make the practice of law better all around. And on the mental health front, forgive yourself the inevitable missteps that you will make along the way. Mistakes with a healthy dose of resilience are how we grow and learn and get better. Even missteps in professional direction are recoverable, and in fact, they often transform into unexpected opportunities. Your first job in the law will not be your last. And as you've heard, I've tried my hand at clerking, prosecution, defense, private practice with a few firms, public service, academia, and now as a judge. You too may find yourself trying different options until you settle into your own place in the law. At each step, you make the best decision you can at the time, and you give it your best. But if you have, and it's not working, don't despair. That's not failure. That's just the wrong fit. And reach out to friends, family, and mentors as you redirect. Make change. You will find your place in time. Second, we still have a long way to go to ensure full participation in this profession. Despite advancements of women and minorities in the legal field, the highest rungs of the profession continue to evade them. Women make up, as you know, half of all law school graduates, almost half of all associates, but only one out of five law firm partners. And although African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, and Native Americans constitute about a third of the population and a fifth of law school graduates, they account for fewer than 7% of law firm partners. It's therefore heartening to see, both in the bar and the judiciary, 
folks taking this issue in hand and instituting programs to address issues such as unconscious bias. Also, law firms responding to clients who increasingly want their legal teams to more fairly represent our multifaceted society. But there's much more to do and many ways to do it. One, a cornerstone, is mentorship. When I was in law school, it didn't occur to me to apply for a Supreme Court clerkship. I assumed that was out of reach. And my criminal law professor, Barbara Babcock, took me aside one day and told me, just do it, just apply. There's nothing to lose. Well, I had that opportunity, and without her, I never would have clerked for Justice Kennedy. I'm forever in her debt, but that's not the kind of debt that you pay back. That's the kind of debt that you pay forward. And as you all enter the workplace, take the reins on your careers. Reach out, find mentors, and as you rise through the ranks, and you are the ones that have the opportunity to uh, allow uh, new, new candidates uh, in for job interviews, to introduce junior associates to clients, and maybe even one day to hire law clerks. Be a mentor. Take responsibility for opening the profession by providing opportunities in a fair and objective way. And third and finally, we must change the public perception of our profession. We're not at a high point in the public's perception of lawyers, to put it mildly. As Father Peter reminded us at Mass this morning, if you go on the internet, you will find your fair share of lawyer jokes. And now there's even a holiday called Love Your Lawyer Day, which, if you're interested, you can celebrate on November 1st of this year. When public appreciation of the legal field is so flagging that we need to invent a holiday, you know there's some room for improvement. But appreciation is, in fact, well-deserved. As Alexis de Tocqueville remarked on his famed visit to the United States, the authority the legal people have entrusted to members of the legal profession and the influence which these people exercise in government is the most powerful existing security against the excesses of democracy. If we want people to respect the rule of law and to look at our democracy, our judiciary, and our institutions of government with pride, we need to figure out ways to better the public's perception and understanding of the legal profession that guards them. And the need to sustain that respect is paramount. We're living in a time and you are entering the profession at a time when there are grave challenges to the rule of law all around the world. The chaos on the streets of Caracas is just but one example of what happens to civil rights, to freedom, and to a once thriving economy when executive power goes unchecked and dictatorship emerges in their stead. You are inheriting a remarkable constitution an array of rights and freedoms that's been the envy of the world, and a brilliant system of checks and balances that guards against oppression and autocracy. But those treasures can be plundered without vigilance and constant tending. Civic education is key, and so is your role in it. Here's a critical example. The American people need to understand the importance of an independent judiciary in that system of checks and balances. Judicial ethics limit what judges can say in the political realm. You, who are educated in the law, who represent the next generation of the bar, have a strong voice and an essential role in defending judicial independence. You have it in your power to be emissaries of the legal profession, of the rule of law, of our constitutional rights to take the dialogue about our Constitution and about our system of government out of the law school classrooms now, take it to primary schools, high schools and colleges, take opportunities in your careers ahead to speak on panels, to write articles and op-ed pieces, bring the discussions to your dining room tables, to your outings with non-lawyer friends, even to the bedtime stories that you read to your children. That's how they'll learn to be full participants in self-governance in this democracy. And that is how we will protect our Constitution. 
Bittersweet as it can be to hear your six-year-old say that losing device time is cruel and unusual punishment, or your 10-year-old object to house rules on the grounds that you're violating the First Amendment, it's also exhilarating to hear them already beginning to understand the precepts of a government that will, with your help, preserve freedom for the next generation. So class of 2019, you're no longer studying what has been. You are making what can be. You're no longer simply students of the law. You're its emissaries and protectors. Drawing on the painting metaphor, it's time to take that canvas and make your very own masterpiece of it. Use the influence that de Tocqueville saw as unique to the American lawyer to go forth and do justice. And as we pass you the torch to carry forward for our profession, our courts, and our country, carry it with respect, with ingenuity, and with pride. All the best. Thank you so much, Judge Krause. Really wonderful speech. I now present Samantha Fitzpatrick of the class of 2019, selected by her classmates to deliver the student commencement address. Thank you, Dean Alexander. And before I begin, I think I should let you all know that Judge Krause and I did not talk about this before today. This was not planned. First, I thank my peers for choosing me to address you and all of our guests on this very special day. In 1988, a student commencement speaker was added to the Villanova Law commencement exercises. Today, I count it a great honor to stand as the first black woman to give this statement. Now, of course, over the last several weeks, I have been asked a thousand times, what are you gonna talk about? And every time I responded with a shrug and an acknowledgement of my time constraints. So that being said, I had to cut out some of the shout outs. But I love each and every one of you, and I appreciate you for your contributions to this community and my life over the last three years. Now, before I get all worked up, on behalf of the class of 2019, I'd like to thank the faculty, the staff, and the administration of the Villanova University Charles Widger School of Law for your unwavering support. Now, to name all of you individually would take far more time than I have today, but, oops, excuse me, y'all. I'd like to say that on behalf of our entire class, we are eternally grateful to the faculty for your knowledge and wisdom that you've shared with us, to the staff for admitting us to this illustrious institution, for advising us on our careers, and for counseling and praying with us, Brian, when times were really challenging, and cheering us on in each and every one of our successes. Now, finally, to the administration, especially our dean, we thank you for the vision, and we ask that you please continue to push forward and remain committed to veritas, unitas, caritas. A thank you to our families and our friends who are here with us today. Thank you for tolerating our distance, forgetfulness, and crankiness due to lack of caffeination or lack of sleep. Thank you for wiping our tears and giving us forehead kisses and motivational speeches when we thought we couldn't make it. Because without you, this moment would not be possible. And finally, to my peers. Whew. 
we made it. And at times it felt impossible, but we did it. And three years ago, we were pretty much all strangers to each other. But I'd like to personally thank you because over these three years, we've shared our lives. We've endured hardships that brought us closer together. See every finals period. We've celebrated professional successes, landing our dream jobs, winning competitions, and having articles published. We've even celebrated our personal successes, things like getting engaged. Special shout outs to Chris Rodriguez and Becca Cabrera, who'll tie the knot in a few days. Getting married, a few too many of you guys to name, but you know who you are. And we've had some of the most adorable new additions that I think I've ever seen. Shout outs to little Rebecca, Riley, Nora, and Isabella. We sat shoulder to shoulder in August of 2016 in the Commons for orientation. And over the course of those day, of three days, we were told time and again, law school is a marathon, not a sprint. So we started running. And it's safe to say it was the hardest most of us have worked for anything. But in the words of Philly's own Meek Mill, we had to grind like that to shine like this. <laughs> now, it's over. We're finished. And we stand here now at the finish line, shining. But a new marathon does lie ahead, a professional one. Our legal careers are the longest marathon we will run. And all marathons have rules. So I want to give you the rules for this one before we begin. Now, no, this is not a professional responsibility lecture. I will leave those to professors Brogan and Langto. But here are four rules that you need to follow to avoid disqualification. Rule number one, be authentic. Be real about who you are. Yes, you want that new opportunity, but at what expense? Always living your truth. Everyone won't love it, but they will have to respect it. Rule number two, be bold in your conviction. Now, Professor Chaninson might call this giving voice to values. Stand up for what you believe. We are advocates, after all. That doesn't mean be closed-minded, so don't go saying I said that. But let your position be known. Rule number three, this is my favorite, pay it forward. Just because you are graduating today does not mean you did it alone. Someone gave you some advice, put in a good word for you, or just looked out when you needed it. Remember what was done for you and remember to do it for another. Get active in the Alumni Association, your local bar association, wherever. Take on mentees. You'll be better for it. And the final rule, number four, just keep running. New challenges will come constantly. Keep raising your standards. Expect more of yourself. You've got this. Now, I was raised in the Baptist tradition where all sermons have titles. And if this were a sermon, not that it is, and I were going to take a text, as the preachers say, I'd call this the marathon continues. Because with each blow we've been dealt, we kept going. And in this next phase of life, more challenges will come. We will get knocked down but we have to dust ourselves off and remember that the marathon continues. Congratulations to the class of 2019. Thank you so much, Samantha.
You make us all very proud. With great pride, I now call forward the JD graduates for the distribution of their diplomas. Associate Dean April Barton. Yes. Associate Dean April Barton will call the names of the graduates. Stephanie Marie Mersch. Stephen Winkern Lee. Stasha May Sosnowitz. Lydia Elizabeth Ellsworth. Jessica Beth Allstriker. Caitlin Elizabeth Lawler. Kimberly Nicole Smith. Megan Ryan Precht. Gabrielle Alexis Outlaw. Ryan T. Geib. Zachary Barnett. Maxwell Connor Campbell. Gabriella Eileen Glenning. Marissa Ann Booth. Carrie Lee Cohen. Keely Aneko Crouch. Sean Duffy. Michael C. McCarter. Darren Carrots. Kelsey Elizabeth Kennedy. Lula Teclamarium Wildekeden. Lily Christina Calkins, Cara Patrice Crawford, Emma Kathleen Healy, Ashley A. Glick. Maureen McCotter. Talia Stephanie Malspin. Olivia Cohen. Kyle Ian Platt. Patrick J. Hamlet. Shannon 
Shannon Elaney Beam. Sarah Elizabeth Baranek de Alarcon. Molly Ann Krebs. Ryan Ignatius Kelly. Catherine Elizabeth Albanese. Ryan John Ahrens. Tyler Lawrence Murphy. Thomas Dicton Boyle. Andrew Thomas Maud. Amanda Nicole Berthold. Samantha Jean Fitzpatrick. Patrick Brian Gillespie. Connor Goff Caulfield Dalton with Eleanor. Jordan Lee Morgan and Rebecca. Ed Edward Harold Shire the Third. Alina Smith. Joshua Tyler Canefo. Michael Edward Naminsky. Andrew Charles Shine. Brendan Hubbard Ewing. Eric Carl Schwabe. Kelly Louise Ware. Christopher Scott Sheldon. Adriana Del Principe. Emily Grace Pittinger. Kathleen Leona McCandless. Dara Shaw. Sarah Angela Grody. Nicholas John Severson. Garrett Trier. Joshua Schmid. Colin Patrick Higgins. <laughs> You're okay. Joseph Francis Caputi. Nicholas Frank Morello. Jacob Thomas Leland. Patrick Connolly Coyne. Thomas Joseph Nolan Jr. 
Robert Leavitt Gifford, Jr. Riley Paul Bunker Bauer. Nicholas White. Madeline McCleary. Zachary B. Kitsitoff. Robert Emmett Craven, Jr. Daniel Emerson Brobst. Michaela Lynn Cronin. Sharon Rose O'Reilly. <laughs> Had to be one. <laughs> Caroline Alexis Kaminsky. Charlotte Rose Merritt. Kevin Joseph McHale. Lauren Grace Debona. Scott Adam Zlotnick. Edward Abraham Diano. Ryan Carl Raymond. Emily Catherine Heimbecker. Andrew Grossman. Ashton Victoria Dwyer. Kayla Ellen May Robinson. Laurel Dertuzos Little. Mary Allison Egan. Stephen Alexander Chapler. Paige Peel Buckley. David Henry Secor. Wakar Raman. Alexander Trevor Paul. Narabin Amin. Matthew K. Steen. Olenike Okande. Priscilla Zanette Torres with Isabella. Adeshoa Egunshola. Ibadayo Ayomide Jagede. Nigel Demetrius James. Anthony Jason Davila. Brielle Arch. Daniel Lewis Silvetta. Shauna 
Riley. William Arthur Kapp. Teresa Ann Castellucci. Alyssa Nicole Pooler. Catherine Teresa Siegeltuck. Catherine L. Apple. Kelly Barry. Amanda Grace So. Samuel Troy Cooper. Lee Allison Gallo. Timothy Joseph Mooney. Nathaniel Fortner Williams. Nico Ruggelbuto. <laughs> Ian Michael Pearlstein. Alexander Joseph Stella. Michael Robert Halber. Joshua McDoom. Michael James Scher. Peter James Comatel. I know you. Peyton Valentine Carper. Mercedes N. Robertson. Valerie Cruz. Isabel Cristina Davier Lopez. Christopher Anthony Palisano. Natalie Nuri Galvez. Emily Marie Finnegan. Rachel Lasitza. Ava Ray Giacobo. Constance Snyder Saketa. Sarah Panic. Libby Ann Hemler. Melissa Ann Zilhart. Caitlin Crawl. Anna Kristen Boyd. Jessica Accurso. Claire Louise Mullen. Brooke Suzanne Harley. Madeline Casey Troutman.
Rachel Elizabeth Thompson. Samuel J. Ferris. Jeffrey Jarrell Johnson. Graham Patrick Conlin. Alexander Kenneth Campbell. John William Sexton. Abraham Christopher Schneider. Matthew John McElvenny. Joseph Samuel Jr. Allison Michelle Wigand. <laughs> Savannah Lee Durham. Yalda Hajavi. Jennifer Lynn Glosser. Joseph DeSandro. Paul Fenaroli. Daniel Lee Maskey. Jerry Dion Rossius. Michael David Hardigan, Jr. Raymond Leonard Davis IV. Nicholas F. Hillowack. Benjamin Chapman Ward. Aaron Eileen O'Hare. Catherine Ryan. Kenneth Norton. Alexandria Phyllis Murphy. Elizabeth Catalano. Mary Gibson Wagner. Casey Kurgidis. Ashley Sebia. Eliana Reed Winderman. Elizabeth Sion. Dominic Areste Chicanelli. Jacqueline Michelle Dakin. Robert Michael Kuhnley. Megan Patricia O'Donnell. Catherine Aaron Luchansky. John Thomas Morgan, Jr. Natalie Marie Brennan.
Mackenzie Seatech. John Thomas Maraglia. Timothy J. Muyano. Kyle Kreviker. Khalil Wilkes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, that family wins the contest. Jason Kaner. Robert Leeson. William Thomas. Cowan the fourth. Tanner McCarran. Daniel Michael Baker. Mark Vincent Humandap. Rohan Mohanty. Ryan Eric Dieter. Christopher Ryan Rodriguez. Rebecca A. Cabrera. Zoe Hannah Lee. Justin J. Michael Schilling. Daniela Alvarez Rodriguez. Caitlin Edith Foley. Ariel Ratush. Nicole Ann Sardella. Joanna Brankoff. John Michael Vernon. Connor Ryan Adamson. Andrew David Sipple. Nicholas Voss. Ryan McBratney Swanick. Professor Joy Mullane, Faculty Director of the Graduate Tax Program, will now present the recipients of the Master of Laws in Taxation. Andres Aviles. Lauren De Alessandro.
Shanna Spiro. Nicholas Carter. David Greenberg. Andrew Lawson. University President Father Peter Donahue will now confer the Juris Doctor degrees. Candidates who have been approved for the degree, please rise and remain standing until your degrees have been conferred. Father President, I present for the degree of Juris Doctor the candidates who have been approved by the faculty and whose names are on the official list for graduation. In our program, you will note the names of the candidates who will graduate cum laude and magna cum laude. Deserving of special mention are the following individuals who graduate summa cum laude. Peyton Valentine Carper, Jacqueline Michelle Dakin, Ava Ray Giacobo, Talia Stephanie Malispin. By the authority committed to me by the trustees, I confer upon you the degree of Juris Doctor, admitting you to all the rights and privileges which throughout the world pertain to that degree. In testimony whereof, you have received the diploma of the university, officially signed and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Congratulations. University President Father Peter Donahue will now confer the degrees of Master of, Ta of Laws in Taxation. <laughs> Candidates who have been approved for that degree, please rise and remain standing until your degrees have been confirmed. Father President, I present for the degree of Master of Laws in Taxation the candidates who have been approved by the faculty and whose names are on the official list for graduation. By the authority committed to me by the trustees, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Laws in Taxation, admitting you to all the rights and privileges which throughout the world pertain to that degree. In testimony whereof you have received the diploma of the university, officially signed and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Congratulations. Well, congratulations to all of you. I'm sorry that the Masters of Taxation didn't get a rousing applause as the lawyers did, but so that's a good sign. Maybe your people are feeling better about lawyers these days, so. You've gotten a lot of lessons today, and, and both our speakers today, both women gave you a lot of fine um, examples of what you need to do as you move on into this field. But I, I think if you followed the challenges that both of them placed before you, you would see that it follows a certain train of thought, that every Villanovan should know, that veritas, unitas, and caritas. I pray that every day you find ways to ignite change in yourselves and with others. Over these years, you have journeyed together, 
You have supported and confronted each other. You have agreed and you have disagreed. You have laughed and cried, debated and cheered together. You have taught and learned from one another. But most importantly, together you have grown and you have become different because of the encounters that you have had with each other. You have been poets and prophets, saints and sinners. You have succeeded and failed. You have won and lost. But most importantly, you have learned from both your successes and your failures. Don't ever forget that on this journey, 800 Lancaster Avenue will always be a home to you. We have given you the keys and nowadays the codes to open new doors and to make wherever you go another Villanova. On the day that you first arrived at orientation, I told you about a man by the name of Patrick Moriarty, one of the founding Augustinian friars, who christened the law school property as Mount Misery. Well, you have conquered it, and you have met the challenges. And I ask you to use your law knowledge to relieve the misery of others. Thank you for all you have given to this Augustinian community. We will miss you, and you will always be in our minds and in our hearts. Congratulations, good luck, and please keep in touch and give back. We are almost at the end of our 64th law school commencement, and I want to just take a moment to speak about this remarkable day. Before doing so, I want to say a few quick thank yous. Uh, very special thanks to Father Peter Donahue and the Provost Pat Majitti, and the entire university administration who are here with us as well for their never-ending support of our law school. Uh, Father President sets the tone for our university with a daily lived commitment to our core principles of veritas, unitas, caritas, truth, unity, and love. So thank you, Father, Provost, the entire administration, thank you so much. Sincere thanks also to our law school staff and administration who handle all the details of running Villanova Law. As the graduates here have been walking the path toward becoming lawyers, the staff and administration have been clearing that path, tending it, and always making sure it is ready for the folks who walk it. My next thanks go to our tremendous faculty. They have challenged, counseled, taught, mentored, and inspired you, the graduates. They give their every day to helping you develop the skills and the knowledge that it takes to become a lawyer. This year, we lost one of our beloved faculty members, Professor Louis Sirico. As we mourned his passing, we also celebrated his life and his embodiment of the commitment that all of our faculty have to the students. And having said those thank yous, I want to offer just a few words of my own as we take one last look around at this group of distinguished individuals before they depart campus and head to their lives as lawyers. Three years ago, the graduates who sit here started down this path. And I am proud to say I started with you. You are my first graduating class. And in some ways, I will always be a member of the class of 2019. And that warms my heart today. But my bittersweet reality is that while I am staying here, you're moving on. Moving on to new opportunities and challenges. I wish you could take me with you, but I will enjoy watching you from my perch here on campus. Before we look too far ahead, though, let's reflect on this day that we have been given, a day which I truly love. It's one of the great moments in the life of the law school every year, a day when we cel celebrate the accomplishments of the graduating class. And what I cherish the most about today is watching the family 
celebrate the great accomplishments of the graduating students. Such joy and love and pride. So in just these last few minutes, I want to talk with the grandparents, the parents, the siblings, the spouses, significant others, children, and friends of our graduates. I am so proud of our graduates, but not more than you are. You have known them a long time. On the other hand, we have had them here with us for three years. But we've learned much about the class of 2019, so I'll tell you four things quickly that I know about them. First, they are leaders. Every day I see the class of 2019 reflect the critical values of good leadership in both big and small ways. They are brave, resilient, listen to voices different from their own with curiosity and a desire to be better. We don't know what the next step is in their lives. We don't know where it will lead them, but I know that they will continue to lead in their careers, in their personal lives, and in their communities. Second, they're smart. These graduates excelled in high school and college and earned a coveted spot in our, in our very challenging law school. They have studied a range of subjects from constitutional law to evidence to intellectual property, mastering each one along the way. They have researched and written excellent papers, exams, and briefs. They have negotiated and advocated in court on behalf of clients, making insightful legal arguments. In short, they have shown great intellectual ability and they have applied it to the rigorous study of law. Third, they're courageous. Yes, we know that the class of 2019 has plenty of brain power, but that's not enough. You need to have the courage to aim for law school and to aim high for Villanova. And being a lawyer is no walk in the park, as we have heard from all of our speeches today. It takes courage to be the guide, the voice, the advocate for a client. It takes courage to be a lawyer in the finest tradition of the profession, as exemplified by distinguished individuals like Judge Cheryl and Krauss. So be courageous and keep up your courage. Fourth, they're compassionate. The class of 2019 has served in so many ways, demonstrating a deep concern and commitment to others, including each other. They share their lives with each other and in turn support each other through ups and downs, all with great passion and camaraderie. The legal profession itself is dedicated to serving others. That requires servant leadership and genuine compassion for your client. No matter where the client is coming from, whether rising up in the world of high finance or falling down to the depths of despair, we must have compassion for them. I pray that our graduates carry a spirit of joy, kindness, and compassion with them in their future endeavors. We are indeed a school with a soul, and these graduates embody that. Now, I could go on and on for a long time about all the extraordinary individuals who are graduating today, but I want to make sure you all get a chance to spend time with them today. So to the friends and especially the family of the class of 2019, I say thank you. Sincere thanks for sharing these extraordinary individuals with us here at the Villanova University Charles Widger School of Law. And to my classmates, the distinguished class of 2019, I say congratulations on a job well done. I'm proud to be your classmate. I'm honored to have been part of these transformative years on your life's journey. I look forward to seeing where you go on the road ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Following the benediction, please remain in your places while Vice Dean Todd Agard, Associate Deans April Barton, Michael Risch, Jennifer Enfi, and Professor Joy Mullane, the marshals for the class of 2019, lead the graduates from the Finneran Pavilion. Dr. Barbara Wall, Vice President for Mission and Ministry, will offer the benediction.
just take a moment to think about God's presence in our lives and in each other. Oh God, we ask you to bless our women and men who graduate today and that the work you have begun in them from the time they were knit together in their mother's womb will continue to enable them on this journey of life to walk with humility, knowing what is true, and that the gifts they have are from you. Give them the wisdom to understand the difference between information and truth, so that they may better appreciate and cherish your ways of justice and mercy. Unleash the passion for justice in them and shower your grace on them in ways that enable them to imbue goodness, truth, and right relationships throughout their lives. May they never forget all the people, especially their family and friends, who have been part of their formation all these years. Bless them with good friends and mentors who will guide them in the pursuit of goodness all the days of their lives as they begin a new journey today as advocates and counselors. O oh God, inspired by your standing with the poor, the stranger, and the disadvantaged, we pray that you strengthen all of us gathered here to continue to stand with you every day in ways that contribute to building a world of justice and peace. And with the prophet Micah, we all pray that you, our graduates, may always remember his prayer. O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen.